work. So I'm uh, sharing uh, the from my screen saves a website cifce.org. <laughs> So, uh, CEF is an international uh, organization who supports capacity development for finals officials in Southeast Europe through learning. And um, we are uh, already well-established organization with a lot of uh, trainings that we organize for the, reason, for, for the region. And uh, as you see uh, here from the website, you can see a video when you can find out more about us. Also, let me introduce you to some features on our website here in the section who we are and uh, the tab about us. You can find an interesting illustration which shows actually how we work, that we practice the concept of the knowledge hub. Of course, we have accommodated to our own principles of working and the region that we are uh, covering. But this means, uh, in short, that we do capturing, packaging, knowledge and experience sharing. An interesting um, feature of our online work and community building uh, for public finance officials in Southeast Europe is a portal that we have established uh, some two years ago. It's called Line Ministries Portal. It's a dedicated online space, not only for public officials from Line Ministries, but I would say with all uh, participants from uh, of uh, CEF uh, trainings. Uh, learning initiatives where we meet online to discuss uh, topics, to share resources. And uh, here we have several spaces, as you can see, about leadership for managing reforms, public financial management, tax policy ad administration. And in these spaces, we either publicize, uh, we uh, share information about events, projects, but also we share interesting readings uh, on various topics, links uh, linked to um, usually structural reforms, public finances, reforms, or successful examples from the region. Uh, lastly, in my introduction, let me uh, tell you that this webinar is part of the project fiscal implementations of structural reforms that is financed by the European uh, Union. And uh, the aim of the project is to strengthen the capacities of line ministries and ministries of finance from Southeast Europe, more precisely, Western Balkans and Turkey, to effectively cost and budget structural reform. This is the project brochure you are welcome to visit the website and learn more about it. Um, okay, I think um, we can go on unless there is some uh, question. And uh, I will stop sharing the screen uh, now and uh, introduce our topic for today foresight and scenario planning methodologies. Uh, it looks very futuristic, I would say, or it sounds like that. Well, today we will find out more about it and we will discover that, yes, it is um, a special methodology. It has its uh, own futuristic, of course, um, uh, elements and it brings new methods to the uh, classic new elements to the classic strategic uh, planning and we will uh, see examples and we also have some voting exercise that will show us how it practically these tools can work. Um, so moving next I'm glad to introduce uh, our two um, uh, lecturers we have with us Rock Kreins. Hello, Rock. He's uh, here in Ljubljana in Cev's building, and uh, he is the director of Futurecraft, which is a Ljubljana-based business that focuses on sustainability transition design and management. But uh, Rock is especially interested in circular economy and 
participatory future methods. Rok, can you explain more about yourself and uh, about your work? In a few words. Okay, so Rok, uh, if you can just unmute your microphone so that we'll be able to hear you. Okay, perfect, that's it. Hello everyone and very welcome from my side. Uh, so my name is Rok. Yeah, I come from Slovenia here, but uh, I've been uh, working and living abroad for a few years in the Netherlands. Um, but essentially I've been interested since I can remember um, in essentially social change for the common good, which uh, started with uh, sociology, but then I saw that ecology is kind of the emerging big issue. Uh, so I went to study environmental governance in the Netherlands um, and met really great mentors there who kind of introduced me to the fields of foresight and futures and where I developed a kind of keen passion in combining our theories of notions of, of how change happens, both social, cultural, but also policy and economic change with these foresight methods within context of uh, different stakeholders, different issues that different stakeholders uh, come across when they try to either instigate um, or, or follow up on different policy processes and outcomes, uh, especially as regards to circular economy or other types of new economy initiatives uh, like uh, smart cities and sharing economy and collaborative economy and so on and in the practice of transition management, which is kind of a uh, kind of well-established uh, tool set, as you could say, which integrates also foresight methodologies, but is uh, very broader in essence that it, it's a broader methodology or process of bringing different stakeholders together and creating strategic plans. Thank you very much, Rok. I would add that you are also an activist. Um, and um, later on, you will trans also try to transfer some of that experience, the life experience uh, that you bring in this area with us. We also have uh, Dr. Jose Ramos, who is uh, in Bel Melbourne, Australia at the moment. He is located there, but uh, he works globally, I would say, and uh, he is director of Action Foresight, which is um, a business that focuses on bridging transformational futures with present day action. I think this is exactly what we needed. Uh, Jose, maybe a few words from your side, introducing yourself. Okay, am I coming through okay? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see you perfectly. So okay. go ahead. So, yeah, my name is Jose Ramos. It's a very big pleasure to be here. Thank you. David, Natasha, um, uh, Rock, and, um, and then I also want to say thank you to everyone else. I think I missed somebody, but anyways, um, my background is uh, sociology. I did a PhD in sociology of globalization. I spent the last uh, first 10 years as a researcher in the first domain and the last 10 years uh, as a practitioner. So I've been doing this for about 20 years. Thank you. Excellent. Um, let's move on and discuss first the key concepts in this area. So I turn, uh, I give uh, the floor or the screen the, to the two of you to start uh, the presentations. Let's go. So I'll just give a short introduction, but I don't want to be too long since I want to make most use out of our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Jose Ramos uh, today, our main speaker, um, who needless to say has a lot more experience on hand with uh, teaching and using foresight methods than I, uh, with a wide variety of stakeholders. Um, but yeah, just to say a word or two about what we have planned for you, or why we're here at this stage. Um, well, uh, the background knowledge on foresight methods and their uses in, in policy planning, among many other applications, uh, is we imagine quite varied here today. So we thought first to take roughly 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to set up a language about futures 
uh, in order to create a basis that will lead us into the second part um, after a quick Q&A, which will focus more on methods and implementation. Uh, because while futures and foresight approaches are directly relevant to policy design, uh, there are also a particular way of thinking and being and engaging with the world. And drawing that out, I think, will help us in thinking through what futures can do for us in our organizations. So without further ado, I think we're in very good hands. Uh, Jose, the stream is yours. Great. Um, so I just need to, um, someone just has to give me the presenter, right? So I can bring it to the screen. Hello? Someone just needs to give me the presenter. Oh, David? Let me take. So that I can bring up the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I will take and maybe you start. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, who can give the presenter rise to? Oh. Uh, Natasha, if you do mute yourself, I can give a minute more of uh, introduction. Yes, now it, so I can do it. Uh, David, unfortunately, has an issue, serious issue with his computer, so, but we move on. Yeah. Okay, is that uh, coming through? Can you see that? Yes. Right. <clears throat> and... Past that. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, five modalities of foresight. And the five modalities are forecasting, um, system scenarios, cultural critical, participatory, and action oriented. And they're a little bit like Russian dolls. Um, and maybe they're um, Slovenian dolls. I don't know. I don't want to be culturally insensitive. Um, so. Um, everyone, everyone in the Anglo world calls them Russian dolls. So I apologize if uh, I've screwed that up completely. You can't do one without the other. So we can't do systems without linear. We can't do critical without systems. We can't do participatory without critical. And we cannot do action oriented without participatory. So I'll explain how these work. Basically developed um, historically from the 1950s and 60s, um, in the 70s and 80s, the critical in the 80s and 90s, participatory from the 90s and the action with a focus on design, with a focus on innovation more recently. So this first mode of, of, of strategic foresight really emerges in the 1960s. It's focused on prediction. It has the it has the kind of uh, belief that the world can be predicted. Uh, it's about looking at trends, factors, and emerging issues. And a little naive. Um, so a lot of those trends are uncritically projected into the future. And then over time, there's an intuition that these interact in complex ways. Um, and that brings us to level two. So when we think about, for example, urban and rural population, or just population in general, these things are trends and they have a fairly robust sort of data set underneath them. And so we can sort of make extrapolations into 2030 and 2040 and 2050 with some degree of confidence. And so you have the expression by Bruce Sterling, the science fiction writer, that the future is old people in big cities afraid of the sky. Um, and all he's doing there is mashing up three trends. The three trends are aging populations, urbanization, and climate change. And he's taking these trends and he's putting them together and he's saying, this is the future. Old people in big cities are afraid of the sky. However, there is a limit to that mode, um, that naive extrapolation. Uh, the assumption that you can just take something, and extrapolate it forward. And so some of the key ideas here are indeterminacy or punctuated equilibrium, feedback, interaction, 
nonlinearity and agency. Basically, the idea is that um, in this mode, and this is from the late 60s to the 70s, this is when the system sciences emerge. When you have the first computer uh, systems modeling out of MIT, when the limits to growth uh, by the Club of Rome is done, they do these big large scale modeling processes. And so mode two built on mode one by using the forecasts from mode one to look at system interactions and dynamics. So instead of just extrapolating something out uncritically, people began to look at, well, if one thing interacts with another, what happens? And this is really where scenarios emerge from. They emerge from interacting factors. Uh, when you look at how one thing interacts with another, it gives rise to this hypothetical alternative system, and these are scenarios. So, you know, some basic ones we might think, okay, well, there's aging societies, and there's also the emergence of robotics. We have certain images of the future that sort of reflect that. We have peer-to-peer -peer technology plus driverless cars. And so when you bring these together, you have images of the future that reflect that. So um, that takes us to mode three. So the limits to mode two um, is that it's only modeling a system and it assumes an objective system independent of human perception. And so in mode three, the critical ideas that emerge are culture, worldview, ideology, geography, social location, and disciplinary work context. Basically what that means is that any kind of projection of the future, even if it's the limits to growth, their computer modeling, or are any kind of um, interaction that we see between one variable and another that creates an alternative or hypothetical scenario, that is going to be a projection or a reflection of our cultural standpoints. So mode three builds on mode two by showing how the variables within a system are determined by perspectives. Um, and so perspective is critical. So uh, when we look at uh, some of the photos here, we have a photo of ISIS, we have George Bush's patriotic America, we have the World Economic Forum. We have Extinction Rebellion. We have a, a, a rickshaw driver in Dhaka. People hold different cultural standpoints and different worldviews. And the way that the variables that they consider important are going to differ based on the uh, culture and the worldview that 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 is you know sort of given rise to them. And if you hear things in the background, that's the cockatoos that are uh, squawking away. They're very, very loud. So that brings us to, to, to mode uh, four. So the limit to mode three is that the understanding of perspective and worldview is quite abstract. You know, when we think of mode three, we think, okay, well, there's lots of different ways that people are thinking uh, and they have different cultural standpoints. Well, mode four is about participation. It's about people in a, in a shared space, having dialogue, listening to each other, sharing their diversity, embodying their worldviews. It's a process. So mode four built on mode three by holding diverse perspectives as part of a common process. So this is the participatory futures element. It could be live or structured, but it's able to hold the the space for difference and common ground. And that's not an easy thing to do. You know, so you bring in people affected by an issue. Sometimes you'll have minority views, diverse ways of knowing that add dynamism to the inquiry. Um, and so some of the best practitioners in the world talk about bringing the whole system into the room together to begin to deal with uh, the challenges um, in, a, in, in this way. And so, you know, the most sort of common example is just workshop processes where people actually get to talk and um, generate ideas together and work through difficult uh, issues. This is um, a workshop that we ran with uh, museums, galleries, archives, and um, exhibit sector in Australia. Uh, and they're working across all these different organizations and they're creating shared meaning and shared diagnosis. 
And that takes us to mode five, which is the action element. So the limit of mode four is that it does not close the loop between awareness and action. Um, people are there together, they're creating shared meaning, and they're uh, able to do diagnosis and, 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 and understand an issue. But the key ideas here are design, experimentation, actionable strategy, innovation, next steps, policy making, testing. So mode five builds on mode four by translating shared diagnosis of challenges, a common understanding um, into vision and commitment into actionable steps and strategic action. So the, the proposition is that if you have a strong enough shared diagnosis and enough time to work through and build shared commitment, then that shared action can emerge. And so this gives a kind of general foundation for how the whole strategic foresight domain works. So I'll stop there and just, uh, uh, um, Rock, do you wanna jump in um, at all for uh, to add a, uh, any comments to this? Um, I think we're okay. And we have two more frameworks, if I believe, to go through thinking futures. Yeah. And I think we can- we can leave it for the Q and A if anyone okay. Okay, right. All we right. can step in. Okay, so quickly, um, where is foresight done? Foresight's done in government, um, so many places, dozens and dozens and dozens of governments doing it everywhere. Singapore, the UK, Netherlands, Finland with FinPro, um, South Korea, uh, Japan. Uh, I mean, I get, it's just endless, right? Um, in business, business has been doing it really regularly since the 1970s. Um, Shell Oil made, made it prop popular because it, it successfully um, was able to pivot out of the OPEC crisis. Um, Rene Roebuck and, and Cum have done the most uh, substantial longitudinal studies of the effects of foresight in uh, four firms and their um, uh, the results that they sort of, you know, sort of provided are that a future prepared firms have a higher profitability and a higher market capitalization than firms that do not use strategic foresight methods. And finally, um, with the community and public, it's used, it's used to do participatory futures, to do anticipatory democracy, to uh, really engage citizens about uh, the kind of future they want to see. Um, and, you know, some of the great uh, early participatory futures um, uh, inventors or innovators came out of, you know, near Slovenia, uh, like Robert Young, who was based out of, um, out of Vienna, I think. So applications in government, um, what are the purposes? Policy innovation, public risk mitigation, R&D funding prioritization, one example being Singapore's uh, risk assessment horizon scanning program, where they've applied foresight across all sectors of government. They do extensive sharing of and shared diagnosis of issues uh, for the purpose of, of identifying uh, risks early and not getting surprised. They got hit by SARS, they got hit by Jama Islamiya, and they got hit by the Asian financial crisis. And after those three things, they said, we want an early warning system. In business, purposes are enterprise innovation, product design, strategic agility, and investment. An example being a DHL strategic innovation program where they um, looked at how they needed to um, lower their carbon impacts and, and began to develop um, the systems around uh, logistics being um, fossil fuel free. And as a result, they built an entire sector of their business, um, which not only decarbonized the logistics fleet, but actually began to sell um, uh, utility vehicles that were um, all electric. And then in community and the public, the purposes are to engage the community and citizens in change, generate collective intelligence, and one example being Magnetic South, um, uh, a program run in New Zealand after Christchurch was destroyed by 
to earthquakes, uh, they used a massive online multiplayer game to, to get thousands of people uh, to uh, imagine how they might rebuild the city of Christchurch. And so they created visions for the city of Christchurch on the back of um, thousands of people interacting in a game-like setting. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go into uh, the Futures Landscape, a framework by Sohail, Inayatullah, and Hardin Tibbs. The basic idea is that um, in any organization, uh, there are four metaphors that operate. The star, the mountaintop, the chessboard, and the jungle. The star represents um, your vision. The mountaintop represents uh, a 360 degree view of the world and the ability to look at horizons. And the chessboard represents the ability to have, to make intelligent strategic steps. And um, working off the um, sort of uh, con the concepts of Henry Mintzberg, the strategy guru, he talked about the strategic decision-making environment. And so he basically said, a robust strategic decision-making environment has all three of these elements. It has intended strategy. There's a place where people want to go. They know where they want to go. They have a vision. There's emergent strategy, which is they're looking outside. They're looking at what might happen. And then there's, there's the ability to realize strategy, which is the ability to take the intelligent steps and the capabilities required to take those steps. So if we think about this uh, in different language, we might say that the star is inside vision. It's the inner vision of an organization or a people. The mountaintop is the outside intelligence. And then the, the chessboard is the inside capabilities. If you don't have the capabilities, you can have vision and intelligence, but you can't realize the vision. If you don't have the outside intelligence, you might have vision and operational capability, but you're not informed by the changing world, and you're going to get blindsided by change. And if you don't have uh, the vision, then you might have the intel and operational capability, but you don't have an anchor. You don't know where you want to go. So these are audit questions that, that organizations need to ask themselves. They need to ask uh, across this, um, do they have the capability at the star with the mountaintop, with the chessboard, and with the jungle? And are they aligned? So oftentimes you might have strong vision, but the strategies are not aligned to the vision. Or you might have a great vision, but the future landscape is telling you something very different about how the world's changing. So you have to adapt the vision. So alignment is a really critical concept here. And that takes us to the Futures Cone. And the Futures Cone uh, by Joe Voros is a way of conceptualizing change over time. The basic idea is that um, if we think about the standpoint from now and we think about tomorrow, let's put ourselves in, in the world of tomorrow. Well, tomorrow's not going to change a whole lot. Tomorrow might change a little bit, right? I might eat something different, you know, a new business might pop up in my town or my city. Right, but not a lot changes. But as you move through time, then the capacity for change to be more and more divergent opens up. And that means we have different, we might call categories of divergence. The first category of divergence is the projected future. It's business as usual. We just think the future is going to be the same as, as yesterday. And then we have uh, the probable. The probable is just based on the trends. We know what the population projections are. We know what the trend, uh, the trend graphs tell us. But then if we open up a little bit more, it's the plausible. Based on current, current knowledge, what could happen? So there's some emerging issues that we know exist, and they might have some impacts. We know blockchain might have an impact. We might know this or that might have an impact. And then there's possible futures, which are future knowledge, what might happen. So we know that quantum um, computing is just beginning to reach the application stage. It's been in the theoretical stage. We haven't really understood it well, but 
Um, but we know that it's going to lead to these new applications, and we can already see them happen. And then the preposterous are the things that are totally outside of our frame of reference, and they're not, we just don't believe they're going to happen. Now, um, the aspect of this is that we have our preferred futures, the futures that we want, and these might be an overlap of a bit of preposterous, a bit of probable, and a bit of possible. And this is really important. We have to have an anchor for um, where we want to go. It's really fundamental to human well-being and the navigation of our societies and our organizations. And so when we think back, we think, okay, 15 years, you know, we might, we, it would have been hard to imagine in 15 years, such disruptive change. Um, we have apps for dating, you know, I could never imagine that um, or for meditation. And so this brings us to this really critical idea that as human beings, we walk backwards into the future. So um, you can try this sometime um, in a safe room. I don't want you to do this um, outside on, or on a public uh, uh, sort of walkway because you're going to get into real trouble and get hit by a car or a bus and you're going to blame me. So no walking backwards. Um, but if you're in the, in the comfort of your own room, try to do this. This is basically what we do in our lives. The basic idea is that um, when researchers look at uh, what happens in the human brain, when they ask people to think about the future, uh, the parts of the future that light up, uh, the parts of the brain that light up are our memory centers. And so the basic idea is that when we think about the future, we draw on our memories. We draw on anchor memories. Anchor memories are, 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 are strong memories where we recollect something, and we use those anchor memories and extrapolate that um, into this sort of notion of the future. There is no part of the human brain that is the future part of the brain. It would have been really cool if we found it, but it doesn't exist. We have memory centers and we go back to our memory centers to think about the future. Now, what does this mean practically? Well, it means that we have strong cultural anchors for what the future is. We have a continuity bias. We're actually biased towards seeing the future as a, uh, a continuation of the present. And so what this means is that if we want to think about alternative futures and change, we actually have to create memories of alternative futures. And that's not an easy thing to do because those memories that brain are the ones that are anchor memories. And so the evolutionary context of this is really fundamental. We've had millions of years of slow change end of the ice age might have took five or 10,000 years. So in terms of human neurophysiology, the idea is that we're wired up for continuity, that our brains are not good at disruptive change or seeing alternative futures. This alternative future thing is unnatural. And as cultural beings, we preserve assumptions. You know, you can look at any science, any cultural institution, look at the Vatican, right? We, we preserve cultural assumptions as long as we possibly can. And we pass these on to other people, even when the context changes. Now, that may have worked in prehistory. If we imagine change in prehistory, things change really slow. You know, we've been hunting, um, you know, um, elephants in a certain way for 5,000 years. Right? We'll keep on doing that thing. And we think of the, okay, change is a little bit faster, but it's still pretty slow. Now, change today is really fast. And that's where we uh, really need these new tools to help us get outside of that continuity bias. And we can imagine change even faster. 
And so that brings us finally to the idea of the used future, an idea by Sahayo Naitula, which is, which is an image in our minds of a future unconsciously or uncritically taken or adopted from another context, or just an older vision with declining relevance to the new situation and the new context. It's this image that we hold, this assumption that we have about the future, and we're not letting it go. We're holding on to it. We're holding on to it not because we want to, but because everyone's holding on to this, but it's not helping us. It's a future bought in a used car lot. It's somebody else's future. It's taken from another context. It might not be a great fit here. Maybe it used to make sense, but conditions have changed. You know, like the idea of continued growth, right? That used to make sense, but now we have this context of ecological um, crises. And now we have to now consider uh, planetary ecological boundaries. It might have been a great idea at the time, but now the effects show otherwise. So this was the image of transport in the 1940s and 50s. You know, it was modernist. You know, we had the architecture of Le Corbusier. We were enamored with the power of technology. And this image of the future, images of the future have power. They have real power. This is what the image of the future looks like when you apply it in Los Angeles. This is the city where I grew up in, where they created um, um, these insane superstructures that they called freeways that were really modeled on this modernist assumption of limitless energy and, um, and limitless space. This is what happens when you apply this image of the future to bank. You've got a whole situation, right? Anyone who's been to Bangkok knows exactly what this is. You'll get uh, hijacked by a tuk-tuk driver and you'll be stuck there for hours. It's a lot of fun. And this is Singapore that decided to say, we're not going to go with the used future. We're going to go with a future that works for us. We're going to make it super expensive to drive in the center of town. And we're going to create a very extensive uh, public transport system modeled on Paris or modeled on, you know, other cities that um, really did it different. So, um, so that, that's basically, that brings us to the end, I think. Um, there'll be a Q and A, um, but I encourage you to think about what is the used future in your area? Um, and, and, and what are some of the images floating around in finance or in, in the policy area and in, in the space that you think are outdated and that need to be challenged? Um, so, so I'll stop there. And I think it's time for the Q and A, right? Right. Um, thank you, Jose. Very interesting uh, start. Um, I ask the participants if there are any questions. Just um, uh, let them pop up now. Otherwise, we can continue and um, I invite you to stay to the end because we have an interactive exercise at the end to practice a bit uh, the concepts. So, again, any questions? I'm not receiving signals or in the chat, so let's go on. Can I just um, uh, suggest that just ask this question, what are the used future in finance or in, in the policy finance area? I think that could be useful for people to think about for two or three minutes. If you think we have time, if not, that's fine. I'm happy to go on. Well, it's certainly a question uh, worth uh, reflecting. Um, we are a bit uh, behind the schedule, but we can take this question now and may, maybe come back to it again at the end of the webinar. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, Rock, did you want to um, 
jump in with your comments towards the end of that, um, you know, as, yeah. Sure, yeah, I can uh, kind of lead a segue into the second part. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff, I think, a lot of different frameworks for thinking about futures and foresight um, and their applications. Or rather, in, in this next step, we will look more closely at some concrete frameworks, methodologies, um, and their use. Um, this was also kind of, uh, we tried to align this with uh, the poll submissions that we got um, from the sides of some participants. Um, where there was also some interest in, in applications in sustainability transitions contexts. Um, and so, well, after this, we will also be doing, as promised, an exercise. Uh, it's not that kind of exercise. So it, it's something to truly look forward to, I think. Uh, no pun intended. Um, I think, yeah, with that, if there aren't any questions at this point, uh, we could move on to to the practical applications. Okay, I just put uh, the question that uh, was framed in the chat, so you can think about it and uh, answer there. You know, so let's see if anybody uh, will have the courage to uh, provide some uh, insight. And yeah, I give you back the word. Okay, so should we go on then? Uh, Natasha, you, your microphone is muted. So, okay, good. Well, I'm not receiving uh, any uh, signs about questions. So, yes, I propose that we move on, Jose, okay, with the great. next topic, with which is a focus on the scenario planning framework, right? Right. So, the first thing, so we left off thinking about the use futures and the human continuity bias. So this next bit I think is really important and it can come as a bit of a shock, but at the same time, it's very useful. And when I do this with groups, we always get a very interesting distribution of, um, of assumptions. So Jim Dater um, came, he's one of the founders of the future studies field. Um, and um, he has the most famous haircut in the future studies field. Um, so he, uh, he analyzed thousands of, 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 of bits of literature as well as images of the future. Um, so what that means is everything from what journals were saying about the future, magazines, and even science fiction. And what he came to was that there's four primary uh, archetypes in terms of how people see the future. Growth, collapse, transformation, and constraint. Growth is the kind of future we're used to. Um, we see the development of AI and robotics. Um, here's an image from Minority Report as well. Um, precog precog precognition. Um, and pre-crime, and we already see that in the United States and elsewhere with um, sort of early intervention in um, white nationalist terrorism and Islamic terrorism. Um, now, growth means dominant image, economic growth future, high-tech opportunism, ideology of consumer capitalism, dominance of reduction of science, material wealth, liberalism, and the win-lose dynamic, meaning you have to crack an egg to make an omelet. You know, some people will be, will hurt because of this quote-unquote progress, but we have to do it. Um, and this is really the dominant sort of um, official future that has um, sort of been, you know, it's been dominant since the 1940s, from Keynesianism to the present, and now we find ourselves in this kind of um, this kind of interregnum. The other images of the future are collapse, and many of the climate scientists that were um, that uh, are warning about the climate crisis talk about this, and people have been talking about the possibility of collapse since the 1970s. 
since uh, the limit or even before um, with Danella Meadows and the Club of Rome's limits to growth. Collapse can be economic, social, environmental. It can be the economy. Uh, it can be the big, there could be a number of different reasons why collapse happens. And, um, and we know that there's a lot of fragility in the current system. The next is uh, constraints or discipline. And so here's an image out of Handmaiden's Tale, Margaret Atwood's science fiction novel. And the basic idea is that things get more and more difficult. And so because things get more and more difficult, then um, people have to impose rules and they have to impose ideology. And so we already see some societies like this, um, but we can also imagine a future in which resources are constrained or where we have particular challenges that require us to live in a disciplined and constrained way. Finally, transformation. And here's some images from some science fiction. The basic idea being um, there's incredible things happening in new materials and biotechnology, artificial intelligence, but at the same time, we see some fundamental transformations in what it means to be a society. You know, I grew up um, in, in the United States, in California, where the context was national. We lived in the United States. And now we live in a, a regional and global context. And we're really beginning to really touch and feel planetary consciousness as we deal with the, 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 the shared challenges and crises that we have together. So these four futures are um, important because they're an easy way to pull us out of that continuity bias and to begin to think, okay, well, there's actually a lot of things possible within a particular sector or within a particular um, domain or topic or theme, or even general, the way Jim Dater thought about it is all of society there are actually a lot of different things happen, happening, and we have to look at that, that expanse and open that, open that up. So this is a quick way of doing that. And there's a lot of cool card games. Here's a game by um, um, my colleague. Is that backwards? Um, maybe it is. But, um, it's called The Thing from the Future, and it uses these four archetypes from uh, my friend Stuart Candy. Um, to help people diverge quickly and think about alternatives. Now, this brings us to um, why. Why, why do um, scenarios and why use one of these methods in the first place? And so this is a, this is a kind of cut down decision-making framework um, based on the work of Jeff, Jeff Mulgan, who was at Nesta. So, Three key reasons to do it. One is mapping horizons to help sense and understand long-term changes to an environment. And that's kind of that mountaintop that we talked about before. We want to understand what is going on in the horizons. What are the alternatives? You know, Jim Dater's Four Futures fits in there. Um, so that, that's, that's critical. And that's one of the primary reasons for doing scenarios. Another reason is creating purpose. We want to reimagine and create a preferred future of the, uh, and articulate what matters to us. That's another reason. Organizations need to know what they're about. Why are we here? And then finally, charting pathways. We need to generate ideas for ways to realize the vision or the purpose. We need to set priorities and we need to have milestones. And so this is three basic reasons why you would want to do um, scenario work of one type or another. So what we're going to do is go through this decision-making framework um, more practically and say, okay, with well, mapping horizons, we'll look at double variable scenarios. With creating purpose, we'll look at integrated, integrated visioning. 
And with charting pathways, we'll look at three horizons. So we're going to look at three techniques. It's a lot to go through in the next um, uh, 10, 15 minutes, but um, do the best we can. So double variable scenarios originally um, developed by the Global Business Network, um, Peter Schwartz and others. The basic idea is that you use um, two factors and, you, and you, you find two factors that are both uncertain and high impact. You need to have a focal issue. You brainstorm all the trends that are happening and in, 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 in emerging issues that are happening in the area. You identify which ones are high impact. And then you say, okay, of these high impact things, which ones are uncertain? We don't care about the predictable ones. We want the uncertain ones. And so we choose two critical uncertainties that are high impact. And then this gives us our scenario logic. So here's an example in the area of trade. And here are two critical uncertainties that we have today. So the first critical uncertainty is, will economic globalization and integration continue? That's on the X axis. Or as we see with uh, Trump and Brexit, we have a nationalist retreat, isolationism, localism. We retreat from this globalization thing, right? So that's one critical uncertainty. And, you know, if we went back five years ago, we wouldn't have questioned economic globalization and integration as a certainty. We'd say, well, that's totally certain. But five years later, now, okay, well, no, that's not so certain, right? And then on the y-axis, we have global transport is cheap and viable or global transport is not viable long-term. Too expensive, peak oil, the impact of, uh, of, of fossil fuels on the environment, um, or, um, or dematerialization because of new technology like 3D printing and um, CNC machines and, uh, and small-scale small computing. And so then we can... So we say, okay, we got these two critical uncertainties. One's transport, the other one's um, nationalism, nationalist retreat versus globalization. And we can say, okay, well, in, in this corner, we have these two coming together. And in this corner, we have these two. In this corner, we have these two. In these, this corner, we have these two. And this is how we get the core scenario logics from a double variable process. Now, trends, importantly, trends should factor in all of these. Things that are in the probable camp should be in every single one of these quadrants. But critical uncertainties are what give us our divergence. And then we can test our strategies within these four futures. And we could say, okay, well, our policy assumptions are, you know, this is what we think we should do. And then you test it in scenario A. You test it in scenario B, you test it in scenario C and in D, and you stress test your strategies and you allow this process to challenge your existing strategies so you can start reinventing the strategy space. And the key is strategic conversation. It's not just about doing funny, nice quadrants, but really about developing this capacity within the people doing this in an organization to have strategic intelligence uh, so that we're questioning these assumptions and that we have this new strategic language that allows us to do this as an organization. This is a super famous double variable um, process that was done. Um, they're called the Montfleur scenarios and they were done for the state of South Africa before apartheid. And this is one of the critical um, this is one of the critical um, catalysts for dismantling apartheid in South Africa, um, where they looked at, you know, is our policies decisive or indecisive? Is governance non-representative or representative? And these are the four futures. And the, um, the government at the time, uh, de the declared government, we're so, we're so um, shocked by some of these that they decided 
we have to push forward with um, unraveling the apartheid um, sort of structures. In particular, the, um, the ostrich in, with his head in the sand. So you flesh out, weave scenarios, you rehearse the future, you find the gambles, you find the risks in the different scenarios. You imagine signposts as well. So you can track whether the future is moving towards one of these scenarios based on a particular indicator. There are indicators that you can draw out that tell you, oh, okay, well, you know, we did this process a year ago, a year later, this indicator is telling us that we're moving towards scenario A. Okay, what does that mean? Does that mean we have to be thinking about, you know, X, Y, or Z? You also have to ask, what are the cultural and disciplinary perspectives? Um, do the variables make sense? From what cultural and disciplinary perspectives do the variables not make sense? So we have to use mode three, the cultural and the critical, to challenge the variables. Because this in itself is only mode two. It's forecasting and then looking at the interaction between some forecasts. So this is mode one and mode two. But if you don't do mode three and question the underlying cultural and um, uh, worldviews underneath this, then you're not going to have a very rigorous uh, view of the future. So you have to be able to look at this and go, okay, well, X axis, what are we missing? What another culture say is critical, high impact, and uncertain? What would another disciplinary perspective say? What would ecology say? You know, what would um, sociology say? What would minorities say? What would women say? What would, you know, uh, perspectives that are, are overlooked? You know, they have to be brought into this. Okay, now I'll move on to the three horizons. So, so I showed I showed this one to look at um, a mapping horizons. So the next thing I'm going to show is one for charting pathways, which is three horizons. This was developed by um, Andrew Curry and Anthony Hodgson. They're in the UK, and uh, Bill Sharp. And the basic idea, and this one has a lot more bells and whistles and a little bit more complex. You have prevalence and strategic fit on one axis, and you have time on the other axis. The basic idea is you have three horizons. Horizon one is a system that now is dominant and fits well, but in the future is not gonna fit well. And you have horizon three, a system that is not well developed, but over time has the potential to be the new system. So this is a transition framework, um, and it has some overlaps with some of the transition design and transition management thinking. Horizon one, it works now, but not in the future. Right? Business as usual, it's the managerial mindset. Current system, dominant view. Difficult to imagine alternatives, but the fit with the environment decreases over time. For example, fossil fuels, they used to be a strong strategic fit, but we know over time, the strategic fit gets less and less. Climate change, ocean, ocean acidity, all the other things that, we're, um, that we have to deal with. Here's horizon three. It doesn't work now but it can in the future. These are the pockets of the future and the present, the emerging issues, the pioneering projects from around the world. We can imagine a different future, but it hasn't been totally absorbed into the system. And sometimes there's a lot of incumbency, meaning the old system res resists the new system. And then we have horizon two. It's the necessary compromise. This is the entrepreneurial mindset. It's messy, it's transitional, there's policy and strategy conflicts, and the solutions may need to be reframed. There's a lot of contradictions. I wanna reduce my carbon emissions, but I don't want my bills to go up. And there's tipping points. 
Does a growing awareness that shapes attitudes and a final political resolution, public opinion matters, and the best idea doesn't always win. It's a battle of ideas. So we have these three horizons, now the transition and the futures, and also different mindsets. Um, we have a faith shift. So we can imagine a shift from horizon one to horizon three between two systems, kind of like um, an, a freeze, a frozen system, an un, unfreezing and a refreezing. We have this kind of messy bit right in the middle. That's kind of like where for change. And then you have a new system come in. And then we have mindsets. So the mindsets are really important. We have the managerial view. Let's keep the lights on. You have the dominant actors. You have the entrepreneurial view. Take risks, innovation, capitalize on the turbulence. And you have the visionary mindset. Imagination, transformation, new actors, emergence, and time as defining moment. And these mindsets also can look at each other in, um, in ways that are not complementary. Horizon one might look at horizon uh, two as obstructive or a purist. It might look at horizon three as irrelevant, like these are just stupid visionaries. Horizon two might look at horizon one as obstructive. And horizon two might look at horizon three as you're a purist. Right? You just want the perfect future, not the viable future. And then horizon three might look at horizon two as you're selling out. And horizon three might look at horizon one as you're a dinosaur. So mindsets matter. So the integration here is how do you get complementary mindsets where you can create teams of people that can think across the horizons. So when horizon one looks at horizon two, it says, okay, you have good ideas for change. When it looks at horizon three, it sees hope. Okay, the current system doesn't work. We have hope because we have the visionaries. When horizon two looks at horizon one, it says, okay, we have support. We have capacity. We we'll use the legacy in the system. And when horizon two looks at horizon three, it sees inspiration. We're trying to get there. We're not gonna make it perfect, but we're trying to get there. When horizon three, it's an ally. And when horizon three looks at horizon one, it's heritage. We're not gonna disown the whole system. We're going to um, use as much legacy as we possibly can. So when we look across this whole um, um, bit, we have the um, horizon one, we have the legacy system, we have two, future alternatives and aspirations. We have three, the pockets of the future. You know, what's inspirational? Four, what is the, what are the, what's the messy transition? And five, uh, the legacy use of uh, Horizon One that's essential to the future. And so for any topic you do is you just map out what's happening in this space and you get all kinds of insights and the best insights are really about um, uh, uh, how we intervene in the transition space. Um, so we can think about what are the future capabilities that we need, right? And what are the transition spaces? Um, what does that actually mean? We can think about the wicked problems, post-normal times, and how do we intervene in this transition period? So that's that one. And then I think I might skip this last one unless you really want me to do it because um, we've got about a minute um, before we're supposed to go into the last 15 minutes. So I'll just stop there and hear from everyone. You tell me what you want me to do. If you want me to do the last um, technique, I'll do it. If you want, we move on to the next exercise. I'm, I'm fine with doing either one. So I, um, I think that we can see 
the last one, the last one technique. We started a bit late, so it's not um, fair to shorten on the content. Please. Uh, Jose, your microphone is uh, muted, so if you unmute it, we'll be... okay, good. Uh, got it. Okay, thank you. All yes. right. Yeah, I'll course. try to make it quick. I'll try to make this last one quick, but not too quick. Okay, let's see how we go. Okay, so um, now uh, we talked about earlier, and we talked about this decision-making framework. Mapping horizons, we did double variable. Starting pathways with three horizons. Now, this is a, a technique for creating purpose, and it's using scenarios to generate purpose. It's called integrated visioning, developed originally by Sohail Inaitula, and I've um, also adapted it. Four futures in integrated visioning. There's the dominant or preferred vision or future, there's the disowned future, there's the integrated future, and then there's the outlier or the disintegrated future. So I'll just talk everyone through what this means. And this is a very powerful method for creating purpose. <clears throat> so dominant or preferred or idealistic. So this could be the dominant vision of a future for an organization this could be um, the explicit vision. It's the idealistic vision. You know, you, everyone's been in a room and they've done a visioning process and they've gotten excited. And then they think, yeah, let's go. You know, we can do, you know, this is amazing. We can do this. The future <clears throat> is what that idea or image or vision of the future, what, what has been relegated to the basement? What has been repressed or disowned? What's been pushed away? It's not considered worthy, viable, or it's ridiculed or not taken seriously. So, so you know, in this image, we have um, a picture of the Amish in Pennsylvania. You know, they're, they're like a, um, you know what they are, you know, a very traditional community. Then they've decided not to um, accept technology into their cultural fabric, right? So, this future is the high-tech future. This is an image from uh, Westworld. And this is the future we're racing into. And this is the future that our society has disowned. We've disowned, you know, this ultra-traditional, you know, life without technology. I mean, we wouldn't be having this webinar without technology, right? So, you know, by this, our webinars disown this future, right? Um, and the disown represents a contradiction within the first vision. And this is really important because contradictions, when they are not resolved, lead to conflict and to possible disintegration. Now, the third future is the integrated future, which is an integration of the first and the second, the first two, where the idealistic or dominant and the disown are interwoven and their contradictions are resolved. And then it's not a compromise position where, um, you know, where the idealistic or the dominant meet halfway, where each gets one thing or other. It's really about a transcendent position that, um, that truly resolves the conflict. And um, if you're looking for a scenario process, um, that's uh, in the peace building, um, the great peace uh, researcher, Johan Galtung, he came up with this transcend method, and it has very similar logic. You have to transcend the two uh, conflicting positions and find an integration where there's a win-win. It's not just a win and a lose or a halfway, halfway. And then that, Final one is the disintegrated future, right? And so here we have an image of Terminator where we didn't resolve the conflict with technology. And this is what happens. Technology begins to kill us. And we can see this happening. You know, we can see this everywhere in our lives. You know, um, science fiction picks up on the deep emotional unconscious of society 
and it, it feeds it back to us, you know, in, in sort of um, narrative form. So we have all these themes <clears throat> in science fiction about technology killing us and this and that. And that's because we have all this uncertainty around the kinds of technology that we create because we created so many contradictions with our use of technology from pesticides and bees dying and bee colonies dying to fossil fuels and, you know, data and data, all the data issues we have. So everything, right? You know, we're, we're in a mire of technology. And this is a disintegrated future where the contradictions were not resolved and the system is in conflict. Um, and this is an amazing way of doing um, a visioning because what you do is you start with the dominant and you do the vision and you bring it out or you draw it or whatever you want to do. And then you look at what's been disowned um, and you explore some really amazing things um, and look at what we're not looking at, all of our blind spots. Then you bring those together and what you get is a very holistic, um, empowering vision that has a lot less blind spots than what they would have normally had. I've done this pro process dozens of times and um, uh, workshop groups love doing this. Um, they feel really, it just, it's just a great feeling people have. Um, I wrote a paper on Trump after, I was so traumatized after Trump got elected that I had to write a paper on it and I used the system. And so we can see, okay, the dominance neoliberal globalization. What's been disowned? Well, deindustrialization in the United States, factories ended up in China, the U.S. working class lost jobs. You have the Rust Belt. Also, traditional morality got left behind by this kind of hipster, you know, gay-friendly, minority-friendly, West Coast, you know, leads the world, East Coast leads the world culture. Um, and where we're at now is just disintegration. In the United States, all you see is culture war, you know, and some people even talk about civil war. What would an integrated future look like where the common people unite, where white, black, brown, yellow, all know that they're all part of humanity um, and they're all part of a, you know, a United States or whatever. Um, and they all see themselves as common people. So that's an example of how this kind of system works. It can work in many different uh, levels from, you know, this level of looking at the broad patterns to, you know, an organization thinking about its future. Okay, and that brings us to Q&A, and I think I did that in about seven minutes, so um, that's a new record. Yes, uh, thank you for the very interesting, uh, thank you for being mindful with the time. We are still, um, I think, in a good shape. Maybe Rok has to add something. Uh, yeah, maybe just build up a little segue into here. Um, so, yeah, we've had a look at three kind of uh, distinct, uh, maybe even complementary, right, uh, applications of, of scenario methods. Um, well, for us, I think it made a lot of sense to give this kind of general outline into various options that would be available to uh, policy officials or, or for institutionalization or for organizational change. Um, but that would probably like the nitty gritty of practical applications going through examples, the hurdles, both in, in, in doing the techniques themselves and institu institutionalizing them uh, would require yeah, an additional webinar if, if there will be interest. But uh, just to wrap up kind of as a reflection, uh, what we're doing here today, as uh, Riel Miller uh, had the futures at UNESCO would call it, we're kind of developing futures literacy. So, in, in the language of CEF as a kind of capacity uh, development organization, we can imagine futures literacy as a kind of capacity to imagine, to question, to engage, and to shape futures. Um, but it's also a capacity in the sense of knowing these futures techniques, where and when to use them and uh, where, where they fit in the broader process of structural change or transition management or, or whatever the kind of general process is. Um, so with, with that in mind, uh, we wanted to at least give a little bit of a teaser of how these methods look applied in practice. 
which is why we conceptualize the short exercise that we will be doing now uh, based essentially on mode one and mode two of foresight. So we'll be creating a scenario grid and we will be using also some of the poll answer submissions we got uh, where we asked uh, you about the different trends that you sense uh, in your own uh, policy environments. We also asked you some, some other questions, but we thought to operationalize this uh, trend part and uh, extrapolate that into scenarios. Uh, but first we put that into two short polls, which uh, David, I believe, will, will put up on the screen. Yes, uh, but before course. that, uh, maybe there are some questions from our participants. If not from participants, I do have one. Maybe it will spur some... Uh, I would, uh, it was very interesting uh, listening about the Three Horizons. So I went online just to quickly search for it. I got this from ITC ILO. It's kind of a guide how to practice, you know, maybe with the group this. Uh, maybe uh, either Rock and uh, Jose could have a look quickly and say if this is a good resource. Uh, I believe it's a, it's a quick guide. Um, my question was, you know, uh, what would be maybe one or two main questions to ask for each of the horizons? You know, when you go to talk about horizon one, what would be uh, the main questions to ask uh, to get answers to, you know, with the group uh, and then for horizon two and three? Maybe if you shortly, like in two minutes, can um, talk about that. I think it's, you know, with horizon one, it's what works now, but it's not going to work in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be the simple thing. And then with Horizon 3 would be um, what, are the interest, what are the interesting pockets of the future? What's, it, what's inspiring that could lead to a preferred future? Mm -hmm. so maybe that. And then her, and her Horizon 2 is, um, you know, that's a tougher one because there's a lot of stuff happening there, right? A lot of complexity. So it's... Um, I would say where 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 are leverage points for change, because that's where where we can find those leverage points. Okay, okay, thank you. It was a quick overview, so thanks. Yeah, great. Um, more questions? I I I I've been quiet thus far, uh, expecting questions from the participants. I'm Jana, the director of the CEF, and I truly, truly appreciate the contents that you've been providing to us, Jose, Rook, Natasha, uh, Binsu, and David. Uh, it's amazing. I can see it being applied to our institution uh, easily. Um, regarding ITCI law and the future's work there, uh, uh, we've been in contact the CF uh, with the group, uh, and I've been part of uh, their uh, futures work. Uh, so we can look at this resource as well. Uh, but what I have a question is, uh, do you know uh, of any application of the techniques uh, in institutions uh, of this region, uh, public sector institutions? Well, these techniques have been applied in a lot of public sector institutions. I don't know about um, the Southern Europe per se, so I'm not, you know, because I haven't done uh, a lot of work there. But uh, I mean, double variable has been done, you know, where where there's sun, there's double variable scenarios, you know, <laughs> they're so easy to do and um, and and generate quick insights from so. You'll see those everywhere. Um, with the integrated visioning, um, you know, I've used that in this part of the world, in Asia Pacific and in Australia and in Mexico. Um, and so Haley and I tool has run things all over Europe and um, Africa, Southeast Asia, and just pretty much everywhere. So he's definitely done it uh, institutionally. In terms of three horizons, um, I would assume so, but I don't actually know myself. Yeah. Do you maybe rock know? Uh, do you know uh, in this region? Yeah, I wanted to comment. Uh, well, I've done quite a bit of background research on what's going on here in, in Southeast or Central Europe here in, in Slovenia. 
Um, but I must say that futures and foresight fields are quite underdeveloped, you could say, or uh, trapped in mode one and mode two of foresight, maybe mm -hmm. using these scenarios. I, I really haven't seen any uh, like practical applications of three horizons specifically. Um, a common friend of ours, uh, of Jose's, uh, John Sweeney, has been doing some work, I believe, in Albania. Uh, but we could actually ask him, and also as a general point, we will be, Jose and I will be happy to also forward uh, any uh, materials that are relevant, both from the planning side and mm -hmm. other articles. We're happy to, to prepare that for everyone. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, practical applications, I think. It's, uh, it's uh, telling also that we're having this webinar today and now, I, I suppose, in, uh, in trying to, um, there was also the kind of practical example of Slovenia visioning 2050, yes. which, yes. which uh, tried to apply some of this with the help of uh, the OECD. Um, but the, that's one of the rare cases in, in Slovenia or, or broadly in the region, I would say, that has actually utilized. And also, it, it's, yeah, the, it's questionable to what extent these uh, processes are integrated into actual policy process or taking mm -hmm. on. So like that, that action uh, part or the mode five that Jose was talking about. Yeah, correct. I'm aware also of the Slovenia's strategy uh, 2050 as the only one, but it's not necessarily that this is the only one. So it would be uh, worthwhile to look who has been uh, working on in this area. As far as CF, I see that, uh, of course, the linear, the systemic, uh, um, it's, it's uh, covered in our work, the participatory also. Uh, I am really intrigued by the action and, and uh, the approach, the, the mode five, of course. Um, uh, this is where I see also the engaging of stakeholders and this, this uh, what Jose, you say, uh, integrated future or disintegrate, disintegrated future or the three horizons. Uh, so that I stop, I would be very interested to to learn more about the literature on this topic. Perhaps you discussed with Natasha and David uh, this already, uh, but if not, uh, 100%. Yeah, uh, I I'm would be really happy. glad. Yeah, very happy to to sit down with you um, and talk through the literature. Very happy to. So there's a lot out there. So yeah. yeah. So. That's why <laughs> a selection. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I turn off myself now. Thanks so, so much. I enjoyed it a lot. Vin uh, Carly, uh, she is uh, recognizing the techniques are very useful and would like to study more. There is another question about the PowerPoints, the presentations. Just quickly, we will share them afterwards. I will say that at the end. Uh, but the question is when we start thinking in terms of scenarios in our institutions, where do we usually start? Which department, which generation or part of organizations? Any suggestions on that? And maybe uh, here I also um, ask my questions. How would we explain this method that is uh, in which way uh, the proposed methods uh, are different than the traditional long-term planning or strategic planning the way uh, it was taught uh, in schools and universities some 10, 20 years ago? Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I'll do the second question first because I think it then helps to talk to us first. So, Actually, um, strategic foresight is definitely not a replacement for strategic planning, um, but it's a very good input into strategic planning. So it allows a strategic plan to be more rigorous. That strategic planning really represents the, uh, if, you, if we think of the futures landscape um, and the star and the mountaintop and the chessboard, it's really the chessboard and a bit of the jungle. It's the Thinking required to realize uh, to realize goals, to realize targets. Um, where strategic foresight helps is as an input. 
as an input to really reflect on um, purpose, identity, um, as, and and also getting that outside intelligence to challenge uh, our our assumptions about where the future's you know what it might be. So, um, so 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 it's it's a it's a good precursor to strategic planning, um, and then the strategic planning then happens and you build out the thinking. So it's it's I would say it's complementary, and um, and I think it's very much a reflection of the emergent nature of social learning. You know, I think in the 1980s, 90s, and last, you know, decade, strategic planning was very dominant. Um, but as change and as things become more uncertain, it's like, okay, we can't just build these strategic plans and assume that they're all going to work and that nothing's going to change while we're implementing things. We need to add, you know, and begin to look at the blind spots. So, so it's really about complementing uh, more than anything else. Um, and then where do you start? Um, I think it's, that's a very contextual, it's a very, that's a very difficult one to answer. The only thing I would say to that is that there are, there are really, um, it's a bit like acupuncture. There are different acupuncture points within a system and you have to understand what those are. So for example, um, did a scenario process here with the state government um, where, where it was with the Department of um, Environment, Land, Water, and Planning, where they wanted to know the 10-year probable future and build interventions um, based on that knowledge. So we extrapolated a 10-year probable future with a downside future as a kind of risk-based future. But it had a lot of support from the very top of the organization, you know, from the CEO. He was, you know, it, it was a legitimate driving down and, you know, pushed out and the interventions were well fleshed out and, you know, everyone had to get on board. So <clears throat> if you've got that kind of political will in an organization, then you can drive the scenario intervention. Um, but maybe you don't, you know, maybe you have to build it in some other way. Um, maybe for managers, they need to be aware of how the outside intelligence would influence the strategies they put in place, you know, so that would be the mountaintop and the chessboard. They're not questioning the vision, they're using mountaintop to strengthen chessboard. And that's okay, and that would be at a management level, you know, so... Is that is 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 our people in a space that is moving fast and changing fast, and they have to think about the new strategies quickly and reorient themselves. So, so I think um, I, I would just go back to Danella Meadows, you know, and she wrote she wrote that that famous article on um, you know points to intervene, leverage points within a system. You know, it's one of the best you know sort of systems based. You know, where are the leverage points for change? Um, there are lots of different pressure points and it's just about being aware of what's needed and what's, what are we able to do? Um, perhaps maybe I can just add my two cents to the first question from Carly. Um, like, yeah, it, it never really helps when your answer is it depends. But uh, I think where we're going here is that it is very situated and contextual. Um, I suppose here it's also implied how do you instigate these processes in a context where these methods may not necessarily be well known or, or uh, integrated into any sort of uh, policy or strategic planning process. Um, I think it, it does come down to some extent in those contexts to specific actor coalitions and different front runners that are willing to kind of uh, take that out. Um, of course, a, a very good understanding of the kind of web of actors involved or, or who you want to include in such processes and so forth. Um, 
it, it might even make sense to do things at the level of organizational change and applying a foresight there also as a capacity building internally to 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 develop capacities to run more systems and, and systems planning oriented processes uh, but also uh, a lot of these processes are outsourced sometimes like what happens with with uh, uh, the slovenia 2050 project where the ocd kind of uh, helped a lot with with everything um, but of course then it really comes down to methods and and how who is included who is excluded and and how so the kind of third mode that that jose was talking about the cultural biases within our variables then it really depends on, on how, how this thing is facilitated to really capture uh, yeah, alternative futures rather than use futures coming from facilitators themselves or, or, a, a, or the range of participants that are invited into the processes. And if I can add, maybe it's more about the people than the departments. Uh, maybe those who are really interested, who want to have ownership in the process, who are brave to propose new methods of planning, um, which is a big bravery when you work in a public institution like a line ministry, even in the Ministry of Finance, um, uh, then I think the person who feels ownership or enthusiasm will, or that is the dreamer, maybe this is the one that starts everything i propose that we go we, uh, we move on with the interactive uh, part i want to warmly thank everyone who prior to the webinar participated in our online survey and in that way contributed to the crowdsourcing of um uh, on the questions that we had, uh, but uh, let's not waste time, Rock, please. Um, and uh, Jose, uh, maybe you take over. Okay, so Rock and Jose, I will just show the first question. Rock, would you explain in a minute what we will be doing? And then I will share. Sure. So we will share two polls with you that we prepared. Um, these are essentially uh, two, two questions that, that are directed at two uh, variables. So uh, one is about, um, oh, let me just check here so I don't say something wrong. Uh, well, anyway, um, we collected the answers that we got from the polls. So these would be the different kind of trends uh, that you would be uh, fencing that are relevant to your policy fields. Uh, we got submissions like uh, pub. Yeah, they're, they're on the screen now, or they were for a second. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Um, so these will be the two questions, and we'll be using the inputs that you give us here in a scenario grid that we will be showing you later. So right now we have a few minutes to fill out this poll, and we'll check out the answers and apply them in the scenario short scenario exercise. Okay, so I'll just read out the questions, uh, give you a couple of seconds to think about it, and then I will open the poll question where you will be able to click the options. So the first question is choose the items, so uh, possible of choosing multiple items, uh, which you think will impact the futures of finance reforms um, to the greatest extent. So it's A, B, C, D down to H, universal income, artificial intelligence, circular economy, ecological resilience, aging population, technology embedded in everything, citizen participation or blockchain. Um, so in uh, 10 seconds, I'll open the poll. It will pop up on your screen and you are able to pick uh, from these options. Okay, here we go. I am opening the question number one right now. You see it on your screen? Okay, so you have one and a half minutes. Thank you. Let's vote. Vote. So we have the first answer. And uh, vote and then click submit. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's important. Thank you. Okay, so we have six, seven answers for now. 
Okay, eight, nine, that's good, that's good. Okay, still 50 seconds left. Okay, 10 answers, that's great. So uh, a question, Rok. So these kind of questions would uh, what the policymakers would start with in the process? Um, well, this what we're doing here is kind of uh, kind of a show of, of the concept of a kind of horizon scanning or or scanning for trends uh, based on a kind of crowdsourcing approach. This would be kind of a first way to to include. Uh, participants in the process, the first step in creating ownership of this process and feeding uh, what what they think is directly relevant here. But then in the next steps, we would take that into a kind of uh, grid and then critically questioning and so forth. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it is uh, perfect, perfect segue. Thank you, Natasha. <laughs> so I will now uh, show you the the results quickly, and then we will, we will move on to the second question. Okay, so let's see the results. Can you see them on your screen? Yes. Okay, good, perfect. Uh, good, so then... Um, Let's try to see the second question and uh, we will use these results uh, for the further in the exercise. So I will just save them. Good. So the second question is, can you see it? It's um, choose the items which are most uncertain to the futures of the finance reforms or reforms um, in our in our constituency. So which uh, items are the most uncertain? Uh, universal income, again, they're, they're the same. And I will open the poll question right now. So this is poll question number two, opening it right now. Okay, again, one and a half minutes. And we repeat again. We repeat, just the question is a bit different this time. So the first question was about how they will influence, to what extent, and this is uh, which of these um, items are the most uncertain in the future. Okay. Voting and submitting. Yeah, vote and submit, please. Don't forget to submit. We're doing good. We already have six, seven answers. That's good. Um, so, if you want to Rock, explain anything uh, as we go forward, this is the chance as we leave uh, participants to, to put in their answers. Yeah, so with these questions, we're essentially establishing two variables, right? One is relating to uncertainty and uncertainty in this case. So, we'll be mapping these on the scenario grid that you will see in a couple of minutes, and we will be kind of discussing uh that particular scenario with uh, most uncertainty and with uh, most impact if we'll have time we can discuss more scenarios but i think just for uh, showcasing the concept and the method this will suffice okay great so i think we have the answers now um so the poll will close right now um i will show you the results in a second quickly so that you see uh, what came in. So I'm applying this, so you should be able to see the results that came in. Um, and uh, I will just quickly send this, uh, all of this information to uh, Jose and Rook, uh, and they will then uh, show you, you know, how to use this information in uh, exercise, like feeding it into the grid. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I will give the presenter rights to Jose. He can open maybe the, the grid and explain to participants, you know, how this will work. Um, good. So, Jose, let me give you the presenter rights. Here you go.
Okay. Right. So, um, great. I give the floor to uh, Jose. Uh, your microphone also. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. And on your email, you should have the results now. Um, okay. In two files. Just waiting for it to arrive. Where is that? So I sent it to Jose at actionforsight.net. That's right. Yeah, uh, I just. Okay, perfect. I don't see it. Yeah, I'm still waiting to receive, but I'm sure it should come any second. Okay. okay good. Meanwhile, maybe. Uh, uh, Rob... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I thought while we are waiting for this, maybe one of you explains uh, this application that we see on the screen and how it is used, where it can be found, and similar. Sure. As, as I understand, this is a Google Doc, so yeah. it is uh, quite straightforward. So you could be doing the same, I don't know, in a PowerPoint or in this Google document. Yeah. So yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, okay. I got, got it, David. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, um, looking at the poll results, um, and my computer's locked, so I have to use my phone. To uh -huh. look okay. poll results, but that's fine. I mean, it's not hard. Okay, good. Um, so the one is um come on Microsoft's asking about all kinds of data. <laughs> if if it so, helps, I can also read it out to you. You know how many. Okay. Answers. Well, okay. look, the the one that won was technology embedded in everything. Mm -hmm. The biggest impact. Mm -hmm. That second one is aging population. Mm -hmm. So we we'll probably go with. We we'll probably think of those two before we go. So if we can just log that in our mind, those are the two that we might want to use, technology embedded in everything and aging population are the ones that have the highest impact. Citizen participation was a kind of, yeah, probably not enough. Okay, then if we go to um, the next poll result, for the second question of uncertainty, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, we had blockchain and it was kind of evenly distributed. It wasn't, there wasn't a clear winner. So we can probably take technology, um, aging population zero, um, we could we could take blockchain or we could take citizen participation so i think it's really the last three we basically take the last three um so it's it's a it's a choice between f g or h technology um, yeah. citizen participation blockchain yeah yeah we got to pick two out of those three um and maybe f and h are very similar so maybe we take F and G. Okay. I'm just doing this quickly. I mean, in a, in a workshop, we'd actually be having a conversation about what to do or not. Right. But in this situation, because we're moving fast and we're on limited time and technology constraints, but, um, we'd normally have a but, conversation. Yeah. But this, uh, the decision makers or people in the uh, organization that undertakes this process would have to go through this similar questioning that you are actually doing now, right? Exactly. Analysis of... Yeah. And there would be more data, you know, people would be voting on more things. There'd be more people There would, there'd be more fleshed out, you know, the, there'd be a, a proper exploring emerging issues, right? Cause we had like seven or eight, you know, you'd really dig deep, right? And then, and then you do a lot of ranking across those two factors, you know, impact and uncertainty, um, and have a big conversation about it. 
And, and then it would take a while to get to your, because you're whittling, right? There's a lot of things that are there. So you're whittling it down. Um, and that conversation is really important, actually. Yeah. So, okay. So if we were just to throw this up. So the first one we'll do is technology embedded in everything. So that'll be, that'll be that uh, X axis. So we'll say, um, we can just say tech embedded in everything, right? So ubiquitous technology. Now this is, because we're saying this is uncertain, we're saying, well, this doesn't necessarily happen on this end. So we say, you know, Tech remains, how will we say it? Um, On the same level or? Uh, constraint maybe? Uh -huh. Or? Like the, the Amish scenario we were uh, discussing before. Yeah. It's Amish, exactly. Constraint or limited. So this could be a few more people Related. say. Yeah. Say again? Say again? Regulated. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I like that. Regulated, embedded, and everything. And we can do the opposite of regulated. So now we're playing with polarities. You could say, if it's not regulated, then it's like, uh, what's the opposite of regu regulated? Liberal. Uh, Well, deregulated or anything goes. Unregulated. Or, <laughs> yeah. Anything <unregulated>. goes. <laughs> That's nice. Cool. So that, that gives us two genuine, um, two genuinely different things. And it's interesting because you can actually see this happening now, right? We see all the abuses with data. You know, we see, you know, what's happening with, so many different, and we're saying, no, this, you know, we want to regulate this and we don't want, we don't want our kids, three-year-olds watching, you know, on top, on the screen, looking at the screen all the time. So I think, you know, we're kind of dealing with this tension as we, you know, current. So, okay. And next one is citizen participation. So we'll do uh, the next one. So um, we might say here is um, deeply embedded. And how might we say that? Deeply embedded in decision making or? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And then the, the other possible outcome would be um, Passive, yeah, passive observers. Yeah. Okay, so so we've gotten our we've gotten uh, two variables. We think both variables are in an ideal world. Both variables are high impact and uncertain. Um, and then this is where our scenario logics sort of emerge. So. Let's just do some quick brainstorming with scenario one. And I think we'll, we'll do a couple scenarios. We won't do all four because of time, but I think we can do a couple and then that gives us, the, you know, sort of a taste for it. So in scenario one, okay, what we have is citizens are deeply embedded in decision-making and technology is embedded in everything. It's unregulated, anything goes. So what kind of, what kind of scenario does this look like? What kind of future is this? I would say maybe if participants would like to, we can write in the chat, you know, we can then copy paste it if needed. Uh, so, yeah, we are encouraged to do so. We all have some chips in electronic chips <laughs> in our uh, bodies. <laughs> Oh, cool. I know a futurist that's done that. Her name's Alina Hilton, and she actually chipped herself for a, uh, for, 
the whole experience of so electronic yeah can you explain this abbreviation uh, it's just the um it's like the chips that are in uh, cards yeah. okay and that you can tap them so yeah mm, that if we do okay good I'm um, maybe I don't know full surveillance like Big Brother, you know, with this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it might be Seuss Valence. Uh -huh, okay. Which is um everyone sees everything. Because if citizens are embedded in the decision making. They're active, yeah, right? They're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Not. Good. Right. Very and good point. Yeah, by the government. Very good point. Actually, there is po polling or referendums on a, a, a wide range of decisions, of policy uh, decisions. Decision, policy decisions are made based on referendums. Mm. So, very wide participation, like and online. Like everything. This. Online democracy, what uh, Jose put, it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How's that policy referendum for everything? Mm. Cool. All right. Um, I think that's good. I mean, I don't think we have to labor it, but you start getting a sense of what you know, and if we have a particular time. We say we want to do 2035, then we can begin to make assumptions about how quickly technology matures, you know, what are the social issues within society that become um, critical or prescient in that particular time. So, so you can build, build in more, but, you know, this gives us kind of the, the starting point. I might just give this a bit of a color for a bit of, just to give it some. Let it shine a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, which one would you like to do next? Scenario two, three, or four? Okay. This is the perfect question for chat. So you just put a number one, two, three, or four in there. Mm -hmm. We have from here. Sabina too. From Sabina. Thanks, Sabina. <laughs> Number two. Let's go. Nora also too. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so we, we're now in a scenario where tech is embedded in everything. It's unregulated. Anything goes. Right? This is like a neuromancer, cyberpunk. And citizens are passive for whatever reason. Maybe because of oligarchy, uh, maybe because, you know, who knows? Uh, I think we need to kind of think through the rationale a bit, but what happens in this scenario? Well, this is the surveillance from, let's say, government and participate uh, and uh, just, you know, that would be the big brother scenario. Yeah. Right, and it may be surveillance capitalism, right? And also government versus big corporations who have the data. So uh, maybe are the main um, um, forces, but the people, the citizens are actually not participating in these negotiations and don't have the, uh, any clue or right to say how their data is used. Yeah. Is that okay? People disempowered with data? Yeah. Yeah. I'm also imagining a kind of world of elite designers designing for design's sake instead of social purpose behind design. Mm. You're talking about policy design also here? Like, yeah. Also, but also service design or uh, yeah. other things. For the masses. Something like that. Right. 
and I want. Sorry. I wonder whether then uh, what kind of capacities or lack of capacities the governments would have to to be uh, to serve the system. What would that require from the ministries? You sense a contradiction there, Natasha. What is the contradiction you sense? Um, I lost it. <laughs> I sensed it, but uh, well, as I as understand, if I can help, I is you know, if we don't have any participation, let's say from the people, you know, uh, from uh, our citizens, you know. How can the decisions be made then from the, let's say, officials, you know, what kind of capacity do they need to build if they don't get any input, let's say, from the field? Uh, this yes. is my question. And, yeah. and also then is it serving, are then the public officials, uh, public servants as they are now, or they become something else? And what is it and what kind of pressure then puts on the people who are in those positions. Mm. They, this is better. Are they still serving the, the citizens or not? You know, in this subject, yeah. But, cool. Great. Okay, good. I think that's good. I mean, you get, we get the feeling there are two different futures, yeah? Um, and and we can kind of see that the world can go in either of these directions. Um, the question we would double back to is the focus area in terms of finance reform. You know, what are the, what are the real questions that the stakeholders need answered? And, and then really to, to test the strategic assumptions within these different futures. Say, okay, well, we assume that, you know, um, that technology would do this and, and then people would want this, but maybe in this future we're wrong. Okay, what does that mean? How do we need to really sort of, does that mean we need to do something different to encourage that? Does that mean we need to adapt to that? So that's where it doubles back to, yeah. Okay, okay um, I think that's, I mean, that's a good demo. Um, Yeah. Well, yeah. Would you, yeah, or anyone, yeah, sorry. I think maybe at this stage, we could just take a minute or two to contextualize this exercise being a very kind of downscaled version of the actual, a lot more detailed and long-term process that this would be. And just this, this exercise specifically and a full array of different complementary exercises that would kind of close the loop uh, right down to the action which is, I think, the, the part we're most interested in. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Back to the participants. Anything to ask, comment, add? Um, we are way over time, but we uh, have also kept the interest of our participants. Um, I think um, this only shows that there is interest and patience to discuss this because we are all uh, already uh, on personal level experiencing the dynamic of the global changes and uh, more and more people are interested in the future um, and um, hopefully there will be other opportunities uh, to address this either through webinars or workshops we at the CEF will work on it um, for now i'd like to thank everyone um, jose and rock the team in CEF, and especially our participants for encouraging 
us joining us for uh, such a topic which is not usual it's not business as usual and um uh, let me assure you that uh, the um, recording uh, of this webinar, the PowerPoints, they will be all shared with you in our follow-up message. And uh, we'll stay open for your uh, interest, witnessing of uh, whether you have, uh, what you have learned, you have maybe, um, uh, you have maybe used uh, or if you were inspired to take some action, to do something different in your job uh, after uh, this learning initiative. From my side, thank you very much and I give back to David. Yeah, thank you also from uh, from my side. Uh, it was a great webinar, uh, so you will get all of the information as Natasha said, and uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, we will be closing the webinar room, so you can say your goodbyes in the in the chat also. Uh, thank you so much, Rok and Jose. Uh, I think it was a great exercise at the end, so for the end, I will just share uh, what we actually done together. So we before you leave, you can have a look at the scenario again. Okay, this is it from us uh, and see you next time. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone. It was a real pleasure, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Until the next time. Till the next Bye. time. Bye-bye. <laughs>